Good evening, and welcome to another program online from the Adams County Historical Society. My name is Antigone Ladd, and I'm proud to be a board member here, as well as your host for this evening's program. We hope you enjoy the innovative programs we've introduced this year. We're giving you stories weekly from the Adams County community, from the battlefield, from the downtown, from the businesses, and tonight from the farms of Adams County. If you like our programming, I hope you will consider making a small donation. We have a red button at the bottom of the screen that makes it very easy. It's safe, it's secure. And with that, I will introduce our guest speaker, who is Jason Heilman, a licensed battlefield guide since 2016 here at the Gettysburg National Military Park. And Jason has made a study of the farms of Gettysburg and is going to introduce one tonight that absolutely surprised me because it is about half a mile from my house and I pass it every day. I had no idea of the experiences that the family had during the Battle of Gettysburg. Jason has a full-time job. He is an engineer in management at First Energy's Potomac Edison Company in Williamsport, Maryland. Jason lives in Greencastle, Pennsylvania, which is fairly close, with his wife, Denise, and their three children. But tonight we have his full attention as he gives us the story of the McLean Farm here in Gettysburg. And with that, I will turn it over to Jason Heilman. Thank you for doing the study, and thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you, Antigone. As she said, my name is Jason Heilman, licensed battlefield guide here at Gettysburg National Military Park. And it's my pleasure this evening to present to you a program I've entitled Plowshares to Swords, the Moses McLean Farm, a comprehensive look at a Gettysburg battlefield farm. Before we get started, I want to recognize a number of sources and assistance that was critical uh, to the research putting this program together. Gettysburg National Military Park Museum Ranger Greg Goodell and his research assistant Steve Floyd. Gettysburg National Military Park Library Ranger, now retired John Heiser, very instrumental in materials for this. The Adams County Historical Society, research assistant Maria Lynn, and the wonderful collection of historical information there at the Historical Society. Last but not least, my wife, Denise, who supports and allows me to pursue this avocation. Now, a little bit about the title of Plowshares to Swords. Uh, really refers to the transformation from farm to battlefield. And coupled with the phenomenon that when a significant historical event takes place, we tend to freeze our memory of that place or person to that time in history. What happens before and what happens after tends to be forgotten. And so it's this factor of the farms at Gettysburg that I wanted to get into. And it is my intention to create a series of these looking at the various prominent farms at the Battle of Gettysburg that we, we look at and we think about in terms of the swords, but we really don't think about its uses prior to and after as the plowshares, as of the farms. And it's so uh, it's that factor coupled together uh, that really brought me to this title. The first thing I want to uh, start with is um, the family name. So the McLean name is misspelled in the vast majority of documentation that you will find uh, on the battle here at Gettysburg. You will find it M-A-L-E-A-N, uh, uh, M-C-L-E-A-N. And the proper and accurate historical uh, spelling of their last name, Moses McLean, is M C C L E A N. I wanted to point that out because uh, you very quickly could think that this spelling is incorrect. And this spelling is based on the many documents that Moses McLean signed in the records, uh, land transactions, tax records, et cetera. And the fact that Moses was a, an attorney uh, really leads me to believe that. He, he knew the correct way to spell his last name. Now, first I want to cover 
where are we talking about? So we want to talk about the boundaries of what is the Moses McLean farm? What are we referring to? And on your screen is an aerial uh, picture of the, the farm uh, outlined with the red line. And I'll orient you a little bit to this. I'm going to uh, zoom in just a bit. Those of you familiar with the area, this is the Mummisburg Road. And this is the prominent Eternal Light Peace Memorial on the north end of the battlefield. The town of Gettysburg would be here at the bottom off the screen. Mummisburg Road coming to the northwest. Uh, and the Moses McLean Farm, what you tangibly might be uh, familiar with, is the large red barn and the farmhouse situated just at the bottom of the ridge. Uh, the most people will see as they're exiting the Eternal Light Peace Memorial location. Uh, this property uh, is what is defined in terms of a sale that occurs uh, by Moses McLean to James Wills in 1869. So that really is the boundary that has been frozen in time. Uh, a little bit uh, about the history of the, the land, uh, starting with Native American use of the land. And really, I'm going to refer to it as ownership because the Native Americans are uh, negotiated with to, to gain ownership of the property. The properties of Pennsylvania are then transferred over to William Penn uh, by the King of England to repay a family debt. And it's Penn who will survey the lands of what will become Pennsylvania and slowly deed those properties off, sell them to previous squatters. And that's where David Dunwoody and his family will become the first official deeded property owners of what will become this farm we're looking at this evening. And then property records really are sketchy from that point forward. But we do know that a Daniel Callahan becomes the owner of the property. And we know that from a documented sheriff sale that occurs in August of 1822 to George and Helen Hines. So they buy the property. They are the owners for a whopping 14 days, and they will immediately sell it to a John Weldy, who apparently uh, bought it for his son, Daniel, because John Weldy never pays taxes on any farm animals. And Daniel begins paying the taxes on the property eight years later and two years later actually acquires the deed. So Daniel Weldy becomes the property owner in 1832. And it's Daniel Weldy that we credit the construction of the existing structures that we see there today, the large red barn and brick farmhouse credited to the 26 years in which Daniel Weldy and his family farmed this land. Daniel Weldy will then sell the property to Henry Dodderer in 1848. And it's Dodderer who is going to start a long line of landlords, people who will own the property with no intention of farming it themselves, but leasing it out or renting it out to others. And it's Henry Dodderer that uh, our namesake tonight will purchase the farm from. And Moses McLean will purchase this land in April of 1854. And that will be around 66 acres that Moses McLean will purchase. And Moses McLean will also uh, have no interest or intention of farming the land, but he will be a landlord. And so why would Moses McLean not be interested in farming? Because Moses McLean is not a farmer. Moses McLean is an attorney. I've also denoted the property owners uh, adjacent to Moses McLean's farm at the time of the battle, uh, Samuel Cobain, Directors of the Poor, those uh, denoted in white uh, are the neighboring property owners. At the time of the battle, Moses is actually residing in a property structure that is still uh, present today on Baltimore Street, uh, just south of the square. So that's Moses McLean's actual residence. Another indication that McLean is certainly not a farmer, but a land investor is Moses McLean will try to flip this property very quickly after his purchase. And that's why the indication is he probably already owns adjacent properties, because in August of 1855, uh, just a year and a half after the original purchase from Henry Daughter, he lists the property for sale and he has now compiled 130 acres. 
And so this is the compiler listing in the paper. Uh, quote, a farm of 130 acres in Cumberland Township, one half mile from the borough, through which the Mummisburg Turnpike runs, a portion of the land has been limed. The farm is laid out in fields of convenient size. There is a large quantity of excellent meadow, a portion of timber on the track. There is a large portion at the place set with board and post and rail fence. This uh, is on the place and orchard of choice fruit of every variety. And I love this statement. A never failing well of water near the door and running water in the barnyard. You remember this factor because we will come back to these aspects of this farm. The buildings are convenient to the town. The latter property offers rare inducements. Signed M. McLean, spelled M C C L E A N. Okay. So he tries to sell it. He tries to flip it a year and a half after he purchased it. He's compiled a larger farm. Uh, he's really promoting it. Apparently, it does not sell uh, because he retains ownership. He's going to. Uh, likely continue to rent it uh, to tenant farmers. And as the years go by, seven years go by, seemingly quiet, we have a occurrence in our country. Civil war is now going to break out in hostilities on April 12, 1861, with the firing on Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. The people of Gettysburg will little know how this war will forever change their town and lands. As local men head off to war in the early years of the conflict, uh, at some point, unbeknownst to additional research needed, David H. Beams and his wife Harriet are the tenant farmers on the Moses McLean farm. And at the time of the battle, Beams and his wife Harriet have a three-year-old daughter. I, I, I conjecture that it's quite possible that daughter was born while they were residing on this farm. Also on the property, and here is a map of the same property in an 1863 period view. Now this is sourced from the Gettysburg National Military Park landscape report, cultural landscape report that was done some years ago. I will zoom in for you. What is nice about this period map is this is done with great research as to the placement of fence lines where orchards and woodlots were at the time of the battle. And the Gettysburg National Military Park uses this research and this knowledge in their continued work to return the landscapes on the battlefield to its 1863 appearance. So as we interpret the battle, the view sheds that visitors see are more closely to July of 1863. Uh, here you have the Mummisburg Road. You have the McLean structures here, uh, just east of the ridge line. And uh, what I want to point out to you, this property actually has two tenants on it. There is a smaller tenant piece of property occupied by uh, Hagee. And so Hagee and the structures right along the Mummsburg Road are folded into this larger farm property. So we actually have a small tenant here, and then the tenant in the farmhouse and barn uh, controls the larger farm fields. As the war goes on, uh, in the late summer and fall of 1862, uh, Southern forces, enemy forces, Moving into Maryland, uh, threatened the state of Pennsylvania, and this is what will become known as the Maryland Campaign, culminating in the Battle of Antietam. And during those movements, the governor of Pennsylvania, uh, Andrew Curtin, became very alarmed with the movements of enemy forces. This will prompt uh, Curtin, in, in the fallout from that, to issue an order for the draft of 15 regiments of Pennsylvania militia. And this uh, call or draft will occur late in 1862. Among these 15 regiments will be the 165th militia. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, Company A of the 165th will be from Franklin County. Company B will be from Cumberland County. 
but the remaining eight companies of the 165th will be sourced solely from Adams County men. And this will be a draft. Among the draftees is listed none other than our very own David H. Beams. So Harriet's husband is drafted into the Pennsylvania militia. The men for the 165th will be gathered at a camp near Gettysburg where the companies will be organized. Officers will be elected and they are mustered into service on November 14th of 1862. This will be a nine-month militia uh, regiment. Private Beams is in Company E. On December 6th, they will get their field officers, and on December 8th, we'll see the regiment depart Gettysburg for service in Suffolk, Virginia. They will serve in Virginia during their nine months of service, in the 1st Division of the 7th Corps. Little did all of these Adams County men know that as they march away in the service of their country, what will come in behind them in Adams County and around Gettysburg. As the war proceeds, uh, the Civil War will have the Fredericksburg Campaign in Virginia. Uh, the Chancellorsville uh, campaign will then be in the spring of 1863 in May, so the war is remaining in Virginia. However, in early June, in the wake of the Chancellorsville campaign, Robert E. Lee is compelled, and he will move his forces to an invasion of the North, starting on June 3, 1863. By June 12, 1863, Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin issues a proclamation contained in which will be information has been obtained by the War Department that a large rebel force composed of cavalry, artillery, and mounted infantry has been prepared for the purpose of making a raid into Pennsylvania. And so as this proclamation goes out to the citizens of Pennsylvania, I can only imagine the worry of Harriet Beams and many other families now missing their husbands, fathers, sons, brothers, who have gone off to war from Adams County and now the threat of an enemy invasion. Now, as we think about the farm and we have Harriet and, and a three-year-old daughter, we look on your screen at the fields of the property. Winter has passed and spring has come. Who has planted the crops? Who was it that helped the farm continue to thrive and be planted with crops? A question that we have. We'll come back to that. Uh, as the rebel invasion, the threat uh, becomes real and enemy forces enter Pennsylvania, th this small border town of Gettysburg, the threat is very real. Um, and eventually, as uh, the enemy movements uh, on June 26th, there is an encounter west of the town of Gettysburg with an, a, the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Volunteer Militia thrown together in the wake of this most recent emergency, and they will clash with the advanced forces of Robert E. Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. And later on that very day, Forces under Lieutenant General Jubal Early's division will enter the town of Gettysburg via the Mummasburg Road. And so this very road leading right through the McLean property will see these forces leading into Gettysburg. Whose farmhouse and barn did they march right past? The McLean barn. Harriet Beam and her child home alone. Now we have evidence and a lot of the clues and evidence of the history of this farm can be denoted from the, the eventual claims due to the battle here. And so from the, the one of these claims, the claim laid by Moses McLean, contained within that very claim is the statement sworn under oath by Moses McLean that on the night of 26 June, 1863, about two regiments of rebel artillery encamped upon his farm and destroyed a large amount of fencing, hay, and ham. I want to throw in the hams. So obviously Moses McLean must have been storing smoked hams in the smokehouse on the farm that he owned. Those must have been his property. And so if you, it's very small print, but I 
was able to find it on the landscape map on your screen. It is actually denoted uh, right here on the map that Confederate Artillery Encampment, June 26th, 1863. Now that is denoted here just to the west of the barn. I'm not sure that we can take that literally, that that is the spot that they encamped. Uh, they could have been elsewhere, but it is also very likely that they would encamp near the road. And now why would they encamp near the barn? Well, let's talk about Civil War artillery for a moment. The artillery battalion that would be accompanying Early was commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Hillary Jones, and we know that he had four batteries with him. Now, a battery in the Confederate Army consists of four artillery pieces. So let's do a little bit of math. If he's got four batteries and four artillery pieces, he's got 16 guns. To pull 16 guns with their accompanying uh, caissons, you would have 220 horses approximately, and this is from the actual official records of the war, he would have 298 men with him. Let's do a little math. That's 64 axles of wheels and the hooves of 220 horses and the presence of 298 men on your farm property on the night of the 26th June. Now, I would say that they're going to take up a little bit of space. So just to give you a feel for that, here is a Civil War era picture of a battery of Union artillery. Now there are six guns in your picture, so that's a little bit more than what the Confederate forces, but this just kind of gives you a panoramic view of the impact to the property and the crops that is taking place on the McLean farm on 26 June 1863. So why would they encamp here near the barn? Well, if you remember the sale notice, there was a never ending source of water near the door and in the barnyard. So what do these marching horses pulling these heavy cannons and uh, the men need water what else do the horses need feed where would the harvested grains be located on the McLean farm well they would be stored in the barn so it's very likely that on this evening they are watering their horses and feeding them with hay and grains from the McLean farm I often, I wonder what the experience of Harriet was on this evening with her daughter. Likely uh, uninterrupted with Lee's orders to not uh, harass the civilian population in Pennsylvania, she would probably had been unmolested in her home. These enemy forces will be on the road again and on the move by eight o'clock the next morning on June 27th, they will exit the area. But likely we have the first impacts and damage endured to the McLean farm. Now, as time goes by and this campaign uh, continues to develop, on June 30th, Union cavalry will ride into Gettysburg uh, as they pursue and look for enemy forces within Pennsylvania. Uh, the cavalry under the command of Brigadier General John Buford enters the town. And as it will develop, Part of Buford's forces will encamp on the McLean farm on the night of June 30th. Again, we go back to the claim. And under sworn oath, it is contained in the claim that on the 30th of June, a large force of New York cavalry will encamp upon one of his clover fields extended over most of the place. And further, it lists on the items claimed that it is alleged that to, they have taken on or about the 30th of June by a force of New York cavalry on the premises and that no receipt or voucher has been received therefore. Okay, so in the claim, we're pointing to and blaming New York cavalry for losses on the McLean farm. So we can go back to our official records and who are these people that he, they are speaking of, this New York cavalry? Well, if we look at our order of battle in the records, we have Devon's Brigade within Buford's um, uh, division containing the New York cavalry. There are four regiments. Uh, two of them are New York. One is Pennsylvania and one is West Virginia. They total 
1,234 men, which also equals 1,234 horses. Um, so we've got the potential of 1,200 horses and men encamping upon the farm on the evening of the 30th. Picture that in your mind, what kind of space that takes up on the farm property and the damage they are doing to the crops. Now, if we break that down and we take the claim literally as only New York, which I doubt, I, they probably generalized the statement that it was New York, which New York does make up uh, better than or about half of this d brigade. Let's limit it to the New York troopers. So the New York men are 667 men and horses. Now, I say if we take it literally, that's still an awful lot of boots and horse uh, and hooves impacting the ground on the McLean farm. Now, anytime there is an encampment and you need to cook rations, you need to build a fire. And what? how do you quickly build fires? Well, the best source of seasoned wood for your campfires are the fences. And so it's very likely that McLean and Beams are losing fence rails every time there's an encampment. This farm is taking a beating, folks, and we haven't gotten to a battle yet. And now we're going to progress into the Battle of Gettysburg as we know it. And as we go into progress into July 1st, just want to make a, a, a statement that it is not my intention to cover the battle in any level of detail. Our focus this evening is what portions of the battle are going to be taking place on the McLean property uh, in the larger context of the battle. And so I will keep this at a higher level and a summary level as things develop. So let's start on dawn in the early morning hours of July 1st. Uh, enemy uh, Confederate forces will approach the town of Gettysburg from the west. They will encounter Union cavalry and fighting will begin west of town uh, around 7 a.m. That early fighting will develop as the fighting then draws closer to the town of Gettysburg and as the hours approach 10, 1030 in the morning. And as that activity is occurring off to the west, additional Confederate forces now getting word of an encounter near the town of Gettysburg will be approaching the town from the north. And these forces will be coming down the Newville or Carlisle Road. Now, they will not continue on that road. Uh, a couple miles north of the town, they will divert to the west using an old Indian trail. And this Indian trail will run along the ridge line, and this trail line, this trace, actually enters the McLean ground just in the northeast corner, what would be behind the Eternal Light Peace Memorial. This is the uh, Indian trail or trace, and these forces are going to divert to the, to the high ground. Now, what this means to our story is that these Confederate forces entering what we will know as the Battle of Gettysburg are going to tramp through almost entirely McLean property. Looking back at official records, we've got as many as 6,600 men and accompanying artillery pieces and those horses tromping onto the McLean property. I'm going to surmise that this entry onto the McLean property of these massive amounts of Confederate forces is going to occur around 11, 1130 on the morning of July 1st. And Harriet Beams is likely still at the home because in her sworn affidavit in the claim, she states that she with her family was driven off by the rebel soldiers on the first day of battle. And that she, quote, left with nothing but her own and her child's clothing. So very quickly, the home is going to be approached. And she is going to get notice that you need to leave immediately. And so I can only imagine that her fear as she grabs, grabs her three-year-old child in her arms and is told to exit the, the farm. Now, where is she going to go? Well. Amazingly, in the claim, uh, we have a sworn affidavit by a neighboring property owner, Robert Cobean. Cobean is the son of Samuel Cobean, the property to the north. 
And in Samuel's, uh, in Robert's uh, sworn affidavit, he states that the first day of the battle raged on the premises. He's referencing the McLean farm. The family fled to the house of deponent's father. Now, deponent is a legal word of the person giving the statement. So that would be that Harriet fled to the home of Samuel Cobean. On the first day of the fight, the house and premises were left in the hands of the rebels. And so we know that Harriet is chased from the home by Confederate forces. She's going to gather her child, leave with nothing but the clothes on her back, and she is going to travel northward to the neighboring property owner, Samuel Cobean, and likely stay with the Cobeans during the battle. And we do know from other evidence that Samuel does remain in that home. And so we've got a little bit of the story of the uh, experience of Harriet Beams and her little daughter. Now, who orders her out? Well, these Confederate forces are going to show up here in the upper left corner of our map. They're going to take position, and their initial uh, focus is much to the south, where Union infantry has now arrived west of the town of Gettysburg, and they have been engaged with, with fighting. And so these Confederate forces are solely focused uh, to their south, and they're going to set up their artillery. But very quickly, they can see and they will be faced with additional Union forces now coming through the town of Gettysburg, deploying to the north to defend the roads leading into Gettysburg. And very quickly, their focus is going to shift now to the east and right out uh, toward the McLean property proper. Union forces coming through town are going to deploy across the McLean property, their goal is to protect these roads, the Carlisle Road, eventually farther to the east, the Harrisburg Road. And so we've got hundreds of Union forces now coming through the town of Gettysburg. They're going to deploy artillery pieces uh, on the property and set up a defensive position right across, right through the McLean farm fields. On the map, uh, I depict for you the number of men. We've got 375, 247, 334 men deploying in line of battle, tromping out across crops uh, that in early July would be starting to ripen. And in many cases, if it would be wheat, it's ready for harvest. Now, one of the stories of the Union deployment involves an artillery battery of Hubert Dilger, and Dilger would deploy uh, much further south near the town of Gettysburg, but he in his official report is going to indicate that he needed to advance further. And quote in his report, in advancing a ditch five feet wide and four feet deep, crossing the field in our front had to be filled up so as to form at least a passage for a column of pieces which was executed under a very heavy fire. Now, what do you suppose Dilger's men are filling this ditch with? to allow them to pull their cannon across the ditch, fence rails. So what are we doing? We're tearing down fences and we're filling up the ditch. And so we have more and more damage to the farm properties and fence lines with the position of the artillery. And as the artillery deploy, flip back to my picture of the artillery, uh, let me kind of paint a picture for you that as we talk about uh, deploying an artillery piece on the field of battle and as you tour battlefields you will just see a cannon sitting there sitting on its trace but in your photo you see how they're pulled they are hitched to a limber pulled by six horses and as you can see that muzzle of that gun is pointing in the opposite direction and so to set that artillery piece pointing toward the enemy you must wheel the entire group of horses around in a semicircle so that the muzzle of the gun is now facing the enemy and unhitch the gun and set the trail on the ground. The horses now must be circled around again in a circle so that they are facing the gun and the enemy. Horses are very interesting. They can very much be acclimated to the noise of battle, but it is a known fact that they must see it. They must see the noise. Otherwise, they would become uncontrollable. So these horses must be wheeled, face the enemy, so they are in the rear of the cannon, and that limber chest that you see contains the ammunition for the gun. 
So you've literally got uh, these artillery and these horses turning donuts in the McLean field, damaging the crops. So six guns with big circles. And this might have been, you know, we, we talk about crop circles. We've got Gettysburg crop circles uh, as they turn these guns around, damaging farmers' crops and fields. More loss, more loss. As the uh, battle develops, Confederate forces will now launch an attack toward Union forces that have taken up a position uh, right along the Mummersburg Road. And these uh, Confederate forces will launch this attack in the early afternoon. Uh, we can put this somewhere around uh, probably 12, 30, 1 o'clock time frame. But uh, a large force of Alabamians are going to uh, launch an attack right across the ridge line, just to the west of the house and barn. And this initial attack is, is uh, kind of derailed by both leadership problems within the Confederate ranks and poor timing, poor coordination. And also, the Union forces have a little bit to do with it, as we would say. Uh, the, the attack is repulsed. And as a number of New Yorkers then counterattack into these Alabamians that are now being repulsed, we have one of the Battle of Gettysburg's most prominent human interest stories that will play out in and around the McLean barn. So Union soldiers from New York of German heritage, German immigrants still speaking their native language, are gathering Alabama prisoners in and around the McLean barn. One of these Confederate prisoners either picking up on the German language or the accent will ask his Union captors if they might know a Rudolf Schwartz that might be within their ranks. And amazingly enough, there is a Rudolf Schwartz within the ranks of the 45th New York. So the captors will take this Alabama German soldier, and lo and behold, he comes face to face with his long separated brother. The Schwartz brothers separated upon immigrancy to New York, one going south, one staying in the city of New York to become a tailor there is reunited with his brother. As immigrants to the new land, they, they picked up the mantle of the place they were living and fought for their hometowns, now face to face on a farm in South Central Pennsylvania. Civil War is known as the battle of brother against brother and it rings true here on the McLean farm. The brothers uh, embrace and speak momentarily, and the uh, Confederate Schwartz is led off toward town as a, as a captive of the Union Army. Rudolph Schwartz uh, will be killed later in the day in fighting, and so Corporal Schwartz will lose his life later on July 1st, but not prior to this amazingly recounted reunion with his uh, long-lost separated brother. One of the most amazing human interest stories uh, about the Battle of Gettysburg that plays out right here at the McLean farm. As the battle now continues to evolve on July 1st, additional Confederate forces will be arriving at Gettysburg, additional Union forces, and the battle will grow in its intensity. And later in the afternoon, additional Confederate forces will come down the Harrisburg Road, which is off to the east of our map, and they will launch an attack on the end of the Union position in an area now known as uh, Barlow's Knoll, then as Blotcher's Knoll. And this activity off to the east prompts Union movements within the McLean farm. So we've got Union men shifting positions, artillery pieces now being relocated. Continued uh, movements mean continued impact to our farm property as many as 400 men shifting from the west to the east. Now they are going to be faced with attacks from the north. These renewed attacks around 3 p.m., 3, 3.30 p.m., are now going to roll uh, kind of like dominoes. Additional Confederate forces ringing the town of Gettysburg from the north and the west will join in. And for the first time on July 1st, you have a really coordinated attack of all Confederate forces. This Confederate attack now outnumbering Union forces 
some 22,000 to 20,000, is going to overwhelm the Union soldiers and a withdrawal, a retreat, will now begin to ensue from the east of the McLean Farm, and it will cascade across the McLean Farm and eventually then south down Seminary Ridge. Union forces in full retreat off of the areas, the farms north and west of the town of Gettysburg. And so the McLean Farm now will have Union forces exiting, retreating from the property, and Confederate forces quickly advancing over the land, again, causing more and more damage to the farm property. But the McLean Farm, as we know it, has seen its portion of the formal battle of Gettysburg. Now, we have no apparent solid documentation of what the farm property buildings will be used for. We do not have uh, firm documentation to include it as a hospital site. In fact, it's not included in a number of documented books on hospitals of Gettysburg, the Battle of Gettysburg. But when you take a look at the neighboring farms, Cobain, Alms House, which is off to the east, all denoted as, far, as uh, properties used as hospital sites, all historians pretty much agree that the McLean Farm surely must have been used as a hospital medical site. We just are lacking the necessary documentation to say it is so for sure. But one of the other clues that we have is a map by S.G. Eliot, where Eliot will come in after the Battle of Gettysburg and he will create a detailed map of burials around the area of Gettysburg. I might note at this time that a similar S.G. Eliot map was recently uh, discovered by very own Adams County historians doing research, I believe, in New York, where they came across this map that was known to exist, but now it has been found. And so a very similar map now exists for the Battle of Antietam. But this very uh, same S.G. Eliot, and what I have on your screen is a segment blown up from that high resolution map, which is available from the Library of Congress, denoting the burials here on the McLean farm. And the red line is that very same property outline that you have. Uh, the single hash marks on your map, that is that denotes uh, rebel graves or Confederate graves. The ones that have a line through them denote uh, Union graves. And so I've denoted them here. I've numbered them in red for the Confederate burials and blue for the Union burials. And you can see them scattered around. There are long trench lines of Union graves in the eastern portion of the property, 22 and 10 uh, Confederate graves scattered north of the home and a large row of them south of the barn. I think a reflection of the intensity of the fighting on the property, and I think also a clue that it's likely that this was a, a hospital site and that men perishing from their wounds from the earlier fighting are then going to be buried uh, nearby these buildings. All in total, contained within the property lines, we have 45 Confederate burials and 35 Union burials. When you think about the impact to your farm, think about returning with fresh earthen mounds of buried bodies right outside your home and your garden lot. Sometimes we blush over some of these uh, unfortunate factors of the of, of a battle and what it means to the people. Now, I'm going to take uh, just a moment to talk about a little bit about the structure. So we've talked quite a bit about the land. We've talked about the people. We've talked about the damage. Let's talk about the structures that we still have, luckily, at the Gettysburg National Military Park that we can see, a tangible evidence. We have a house and we have a barn. And unfortunately, we don't have much photographic evidence. On your screen is a picture from the Library of Congress. This is a picture taken, uh, I believe, July 4th or thereabouts, uh, shortly after the Battle of Gettysburg, by Timothy H. O'Sullivan, one of the many photographers that came to Gettysburg. This is taken from East Cemetery Hill. Those of you familiar with the area, this is Baltimore Street. And so there would be a large water tank here in the uh, parking lot of the Gettysburg uh, Bus Tour Center here on the right. Off in the distance, I have an arrow pointing to it, 
will be the McLean Farm structures. This is a blow up of that picture. And oddly enough, this is our best picture of the McLean Farm at the time of the battle. Now, you might think, well, that's a pretty poor picture. Uh, but let me zoom in a little bit further for you because this picture will become critical later to our knowledge. Now, as you zoom in, amazingly, these wet plate photographs contain embedded detail that uh, photographic uh, historians are now really harvesting. They are zooming in on these pictures. But you can very clearly see the, the southern facing part of the house, what we call the front of it, and two distinct uh, roof lines. You can see the end of the barn and you can count the ventilators across its ridge line. You can count the white dots on the end, a very clear pattern of the ventilated uh, louvers on the end of that bank barn. So is it worthy? Absolutely. It's worthwhile and we can harvest the evidence from it. Um, the, the home is made of brick, a uh, majority of it uh, on the western end, and it has a small portion of wood structure on the end. Now, once the park acquired this property and these structures, they did a detailed survey and study of the property. And one of the questions they asked was, was the wooden portion toward the east added on to the brick section there at the time of the battle. It is this photograph that will be referenced in their study as photographic evidence that it absolutely was a portion of the house, as we can see the distinct roof line, and furthermore, you can count window dots even at this distance on the photograph. So does it become instrumental? It absolutely does. The barn uh, is a rather large German bank barn. 68 feet long, 46 feet wide. It includes an eight foot four bay, which is that part that overhangs. Um, many of you can picture the barns of the area. Uh, that's called the four bay, that's eight foot. And the barn stands 34 feet, two and one half inches high. Uh, more of the benefit of archeological and engineering studies done by our government when they take over the assets. Um, so the bank barn, the German bank barn and the home in later years will be fully restored by the National Park Service at the uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars invested in it. One would ask, why would they do so? Well, when you look at the history of the farm and the battle that occurred on it, namely accounts of the big red barn that they fought in and around, in including the human interest story I shared with you earlier, it is part of the significant story and interpretation of the Battle of Gettysburg. Therefore, very worthy of its investment and preservation. Now, one of the things that uh, is very interesting is, as I showed you, battle and fighting is occurring all around the, the, the barn and the home buildings. There is very little noted in the claims to structure damage. All that we have is in the McLean claim, of course, the owner of the structures, is a $125 line item of damage. No detail. So we do not know if there were artillery shells that plowed through the roof line or may have embedded in the brick, but nothing is visible and nothing is apparently known to us today. I could find nothing in the Park Service records of detail of damage. One of the likely reasons we will touch on later is it will be many, many years before any preservation occurs. It will remain in private hands. Private hands will continue to improve and repair and cover over probably anything that would have been da battle damage. Now, when does Harriet return to the property? Well, we know this too from, from uh, her affidavit or, or from an affidavit in the claims that, quote, her family was driven off by the rebel soldiers on the first day of the battle, that the battle uh, was waged over the greater part of the farm on July 1st, and the, batting, the buildings were occupied by rebel forces until the 4th, and that the opponent left with nothing but her own and her child's clothing and returned on the 4th and found all the property and effects of her husband carried off and destroyed. So there's more clues. Harriet comes back to the property on the 4th of July. Now, we do not know what time of day. 
uh, our knowledge of the movements of the uh, of the Confederate forces would indicate that they would likely be very late in the day, maybe even after dark, before Harriet might feel that it is safe to return to those structures because there are going to be Confederate forces on the ridge line just to the west of the barn on the night of July 4th. But she returns to the barn on the four or to the farm and finds literally a strip house, its contents gone. More indication that it was occupied and used as a medical hospital during the time of the battle. Now let's talk a little bit more about these claims that I've been referencing so much. These claims are available in a number of sources, Library of Congress, Adams County Historical Society, historical records of the state of Pennsylvania. And they are in the script writing hand of the time. And I will share with you, it's very difficult to interpret, to read this writing. And it's one of those things that it, the more you do it, the better you would become of it. But it is becomes very, very valuable when people have already transcribed these documents into printed form. As I experienced trying to read 1863 handwriting, script handwriting in the records of Adams County Historical Society, but I struggled through it. On your screen is the claim of Moses McLean, just to kind of give you a feel for uh, what these claims entail. Uh, it gives a itemized listing of dollar value and the items that are being claimed as damage. It gives statements of loyalty. So you have to be a loyal citizen to uh, claim uh, loss. And you have sworn affidavits and merits of, well, tell us what the merit is that you should be compensated for your loss. And so we have two claims associated with this property. We have the claim of the owner and we have the claim of the tenant. And this is the evidence to dispel one of the many sources of misinformation about this farm that we have in many, many of the records of the Battle of Gettysburg and that this farm was occupied by someone else. A J. Martin is a name that you will see on the majority of battle maps at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg. J. Martin. There is no J. Martin that is resident on this property at the time of the battle. It is David Beams and his wife Harriet. But I offer to you, I have not found one map yet that properly depicts that David Beams is the tenant. You will find McLean and under it, Martin written. I believe this error, I haven't proven it yet, comes from the fact that in the months and years that the Union forces returned to Gettysburg to compile records and maps of the battlefield, they likely asked about the tenant and it may have been Martin when they returned. Now, I don't know how long Beams will stay on the property. But by the time he filed his claim, he's gone because Beam will file his claim and he will be a resident of Cumberland Township by the time he files the claim with a post office box near York Springs, PA. So I would say that Beams moved fairly quickly. Another clue that may be the confusion why there's a Martin associated with the tenancy of this farm at the time of the battle. But another thing that occurred to me at the, looking at the claims is my first inclination was the government is being duped. They are being double dipped by crop damage because crop damage is listed on both McLean and Beam's claim. Now, how could that be if there's a tenant farmer? Let's go back to our story. Who helped plant the crops? on the Beams property with David gone off to service? Or is this a share cropping arrangement of rent? That you don't pay rent, you pay a share of your crops. Therefore, Moses McLean would have a rightful and legal right to a percentage of all the crops that were present in those fields at the time of the battle. Now, being an attorney, I would think McLean would keep this on the very up legal scale. So I become very confident that this is probably the arrangement. As we have both oats, wheat, and corn in quantities listed on both Beams and McLean's claim. 
Now, my background, you may have noted that I'm an engineer. Electrical, albeit, engineers do engineer things. And so one of the things that I did was I added up the acreages of claim between both of these claims just to make sure that we don't have a problem here. And I added up the total tillable acreage based on the 1863 map. Tillable acreage by my calculation is 123. Total in the claims is 58 and a half. So we're clear. We are claiming less than the acreage of the available space for crops. And if I do the math, if the total acreage is being used, that's about a 47 and a half percent loss to the crops that were present at the time of the battle. Based on the activity that, that we know moving back and forth across the property makes sense. McLean claims a loss of 4,546 fence rails. So that got this engineer thinking a little bit. I got to do a little calculation of the Virginia worm fence. How far would 4,546 rails get me in distance? Now I do a little, got to do some averaging here, but if I use 16 feet from point to point on the zigzag, there are about 18 rails in that construction if you use a six rail high stacked fence with the cross member supports and the rails on top. Now, total distance of Virginia worm fence on the cultural survey that I added up is 17,384 feet. Assuming all of the border fence on the McLean map is McLean's ownership, which is a stretch. It's likely shared or, you know, because you are sharing that fence line with the other property owner. Let's assume that uh, that he owns all of it. That means he's got about 19,557 rails on his property. Now, there are also put five rail post and rail fences along the Mumsburg Road, slab board fence and stacked rail fencing. So I don't want to depict to you that I'm including all the fencing that is included on this farm. But if I take the total calculated fence rails, split rail fences that I calculate and the 4,546 he denotes as loss, that's about a 20% loss of the split rail fences. Seems reasonable to me. Now, what is really lost, if you think about the farmer is the labor it took to install the fences. And if you are splitting the rails, you have countless hundreds of hours of labor in fence rail creation and the establishment of the fence. The cost of the rail is the least of their worries, but at least they would ask for compensation from that. Now, oddly enough on the cultural landscape map, if you reference that from the park, on many of the property owners, crops are denoted. You will see wheat, corn, sources that they knew what the crops were. Oddly enough, there's no such record on these farm plots that are denoted on here. There is no record of the crops. But based on the claim, we know wheat and corn were present because it was lost. Now, getting back to our occupants, David and Harriet, we don't know how long they will stick it out on the McLean property. Like I said, we know as of October 22nd, 1868, he will leave. But let's bring David back. He was on a nine-month service in Virginia. His nine months will be up in July of 1863. And as they finish their service in central Virginia, they will catch uh, uh, help from their neighbor, uh, naval friends and take a boat to Alexandria, and they will be back in Gettysburg as of late July, 1863. Welcome home, David, to a, a town and a property that has been ravaged by battle while they're gone. Imagine the homecoming of these 165th Pennsylvania militia men as now they return home. As a side note, the Hagee rental, we do know that Hagee Lickety split pretty quickly after the battle. Hagee's gone. How do we know that? As of December 7th, 1863, just a few months after the battle, that very property is being uh, advertised in the Gettysburg compiler by Moses McLean for rent. Quote, for rent, the property recently rented by David Hagee, two acres of land with a dwelling house, shop, 
stable, well of water, fruit trees, and situate on the Mummisburg Road within a half a mile of the borough. Possession a given at any time. In other words, it's move in ready. So Hagee's gone. He's seen enough or lost enough. Now we talk about claims. Oftentimes uh, we always assume that claims are turned down, that, that landowners get no money unless it can absolutely be proven that union forces were the cause of the loss. And so usually we hear in history books that they got no compensation. However, there is an act passed by the Pennsylvania legislature allowing for the, the compensation of Pennsylvania landowners to losses incurred by this, by the war. And both um, McLean and Beams will receive funds. David Beams is awarded $924.75 of his original $1,066.75 claim under the act passed by Pennsylvania in 1871, for eight years past the battle. Um, and so uh, Beams will eventually receive that monetary reimbursement, albeit eight years later. Now Moses McLean will file for compensation in the to the tune of $1,138.35, but he will sell the property, 162 acres that I originally depicted to you on that map, to one James J. Wills on May 11, 1869. This is the father of the maybe more known, well-known David Wills, the man who will organize the National Cemetery and the dedication of that cemetery in whose home Abraham Lincoln will stay on the night of November 18th, 1863. This is that David Wills' father. He will purchase the property for $8,000. That's in 1869. Moses McLean passes from his earthly life on 30th September, 1870 at the age of 66. His wife, Hannah, will pass away uh, almost three years later, April of 1873, and both are buried in the Gettysburg Evergreen Cemetery. After his death, McLean will be awarded $1,011.43 on November 17, 1871. So he never did see any result from his claim. His son, Judge William, Moses William, remember that? Judge William is heir to this, and so those funds will go to him. There will be a, a case for the reimbursement of the claim by the federal government, and William McLean, the judge, will, quote, be unable to prove what, if any, of the property claimed was taken by U.S. troops or state militia, and he declined to go any further expense or trouble in the matter and agreed to submit the case to the quartermaster general in its present shape. The claim is denied. So Pennsylvania will try to receive recovery of these paid claims to the Pennsylvania landowners. Now, James J. Wills appears to also rent the property as a landlord. against ta tax records will indicate to that to us. And he will pass away in 1883. And his property will be willed to his son, David. So David Wills becomes the property owner 14 years later. He as well is a land landlord. And he is going to hold on to the property until 1899. Now, a number of things occur during David Wills and James J. Wills' ownership of the property that we know today. Right around the time of James J. Wills' death, either prior to his death or just after uh, David be gaining the property, one of the two signs a right-of-way for the installation of railroad tracks for a right-of-way on the property. This will be the Gettysburg-Harrisburg Railroad that will be installed, oddly enough or ironically enough, due to visitation to the field of battle, something covered by Timothy Smith in a more recent post uh, by the Adams County Historical Society, that of commercialization. February 27th of 1884, that railroad will be dedicated and a golden spike will be driven in a ceremony just north of the Mummisburg Road. Tim presented a picture of that with the Cobean farm in the background. Now, whose property is that ceremony occurring on? 
the McLean farm, owned then at the time by the Wills, a prominent family. So where did they have the ceremony? Likely on the northern edge of the McLean farm property. So now we have a railroad track bisecting the property. On February 31st, 1884, David and Jenny Wills will sell 4.49 acres of the property to the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association, and this will be the first denoted portion of preservation on what we know today as the larger tract of the McLean Farm. That tract is shown on the slide in front of you, and I will zoom in as it's very difficult to see. The area where the, the hand is is the McLean Farm. This is the Mamasburg Road, and the little track that I'm referring to is just south of the road where there is this little loop road today called Robinson Avenue. That was enabled by the wills to sell it to the Battlefield Memorial Association for the whopping sum of $448.75. Now that property will now become available to the Memorial Association, and guess what happens? One of the many, uh, the five observation towers, after the transfer of land from the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association to the United States government, the War Department takes over the, over the operation of those properties, and they will install five large observation towers. One of those five will be constructed on former McLean Farm property, the, what you know today as the Oak Hill Tower. This is a photograph from around 1900. This is taken by Tipton, and this is from the National Archives. This is a zoomed in small portion of that, but you can see on your screen the portion of property I'm speaking about. This is the Mumsburg Road. The farm barn and house buildings are off to the north. This tract of 4.49 acres allowed for the construction of this observation tower, the installation of a park road now known as Robinson Avenue, and several Union veteran placed monuments to their regiments. These, regiment, these regimental monuments, here's another photograph of that property with the full scale observation tower. This is a map from the website of Gettysburg Stone Sentinels, which is a wonderful website. I encourage you to look at it. It gives you the background location of monuments all over various different Civil War battlefields. They do a great job with those at, at Gettysburg. But you can see the dedication date on this map I've given you of September 25, 1885, of the 13th a Massachusetts monument, one of the first dedicated in this entire area. It will be the first such monument on McLean ground. Furthermore, there will be property deeded over to the association and, and then to the War Department to establish Howard Avenue. And on your map, I'm tracing the border of Howard Avenue. Now, you've, maybe you've wondered, maybe you haven't, why Howard Avenue goes in such a kind of a crooked dog leg fashion. Once you lay the property line on top of the road, you realize that it is easier to get a road right away from property owners when you place it right on the property line. You're doing very little impact to my farm. Want to put a road over on the edge? Be my guest. Now you see the evidence of why the notch and the crookedness of Howard Avenue, at least in a portion of it. If you look at Stone Sentinel's website and touring the battlefield, you see that those monuments all along Howard Avenue are to all those Union regiments that fought on the McLean farm. Did they fight along this avenue? No, they fought on the property. Many of these monuments located along this avenue denote that we were in position several hundred yards to the north. Why are they putting monuments several hundred yards from where they originally were? Because the property is not available for preservation. It is not part of the Memorial Association. Therefore, they're forced to interpret their positions from a position they never occupied. And while monuments at Gettysburg don't always reside where the units existed during the fighting, that is very much the case for all the monuments along Howard Avenue. And the reason for that is the McLean Farm will not be formally preserved for nearly another 80 years. Now, David Wills will pass away in 1899, and it will stay in the Wills family. The heirs are his daughters 
uh, Mary Bridges, Annie McCurdy, and Emma McGammon. They will be joint heirs to what is remaining of the McLean farm. They will be landlords for 38 years until 1937. Very interesting date. 1937, William Shields will buy the property. And while Shields is the owner of the property, on your screen is a picture of the 75th reunion of the Battle of Gettysburg, where over 1,500 Civil War veterans would return to Gettysburg for this reunion period, the 75th anniversary. On your picture is a view to the east. Howard Avenue is in the lower portion of your screen. The McLean ground is the open farm fields. And you will note that no part of the encampment is on McLean ground, then owned by Shields. Likely Shields has got a working farm and he's in no way have an appetite for the encampment of hundreds, nearly a thousand tents uh, housing Civil War soldiers and the uh, support personnel that were brought to Gettysburg for that large uh, reunion. Here's another view. This photograph, uh, solely the property of Adams County Historical Society, shows the dedication of the Eternal Light Peace Memorial. We know that took place on July 3rd, 1938. William Shields is the owner of the property in the upper left corner of the view. That's the McLean property. Allow me to zoom in for a moment and you can see a little bit more of the uh, property. You see the railroad bisecting the property there. And here is a blown up version of that same photograph. You can see that the barn has been significantly altered over the decades from the time of the battle. It has been added on to to the south, north and to the east. You can barely recognize what had been the original McLean barn. Several outbuildings have been constructed, but you denote the home is still in its original format. Now, while Shields was not apparently party to the encampment, he is allowing parking on his property for this dedication ceremony. I often wonder if he was charging a parking fee. As you see, cars entering the property parking here so that people can walk up the road to the ceremony, by the way, which is attended by nearly a uh, number we use is around 200,000 people will attend that ceremony. Now, Shields will sell the property two years later, 1937 to 1939. He owns it two short years to a, a William and Virginia Meals. Now, this is a name very familiar to the area. In fact, the Meals family was an adjacent property owner at the time of the battle. Perhaps there are relatives. I was unable to establish that yet. More research required. But the Meals will purchase the property from Shields and own it for 26 years, most of which we believe also in landlord status. When lo and behold, on April 14, 1965, the Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association, an entity that exists to this day and is uh, charged with preservation of lands in and around the Battle of Gettysburg. They've done wonderful work over the many decades. They will partner with the United States government for the purchase of 104 acres. They will provide $67,000 collected from numerous donors, including area school children that had fundraisers to grow this money. The U.S. government will chip in $60,000 for a total purchase price of $127,000 to purchase 104 acres. And on this very same date of April 14, 1965, it is deeded over to the United States government. And the National Park Service now would become its permanent stewards. There is a permanent stone located just to the north of Howard Avenue that reads, This land and other portions of this battlefield fought over by brave men of a nation divided, now part of the Gettysburg National Military Park, through the agency of the Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association and the collective generosity of patriotic people of a nation, united, voluntary contributions made possible the preservation of this soil, forever consecrated as a memorial to the American courage and devotion to principle of men who struggled here. This tablet was dedicated November 19th, 
1965, by the Gettysburg Battlefield Preservation Association. They chose to dedicate their, their stone on Remembrance Day, which would be and is still uh, celebrated to this day in Gettysburg as the uh, anniversary of the Gettysburg Address. On November 2nd of 1968, the large-scale observation tower erected in 1895 will be lowered due to what we believe numerous lightning strikes. So due to safety, it is taken down to a very small waste level observation deck as you know it today. In your picture is the uh, construction scene of that tower being dismantled so that it can be reformatted into its lower version. Since the National Park Service acquisition, hundreds of thousands of dollars have been invested in the property to fully preserve the house and barn, return them to their 1863 appearance, upgrade the living quarters and conditions for occupancy, including water, filtration and softening, fire protection, electrical service, uh, including upgraded sewage service. And it is now uh, occupied regularly by a tenant of the Park Service. You can visit this property. We ask that people be uh, respectful of the tenants and stay a respectable distance from the home and their uh, property. We don't like to walk up to the windows and look in, uh, but you are free to traverse the property and take a closer look at the barn and home. In the numerous uh, National Park Service reference documents that I read, Justifying the expenditure of all this money in preserving this land and these structures, it is clearly stated that the case and the significance of the home and barn during the fighting of July 1st. The land and structures are here today because they remained under the plow for 102 years after the battle. Never once was a commercial establishment erected on this property, and now it is preserved due to the swords that occurred prior to and on July 1st. In closing, I want to leave you with this. In the Christian Bible, in the book of Joel 3, verses 9 and 10, proclaim to the nations, prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. I submit to you that those plowshares were beaten into swords in late June, early July of 1863. And in many ways, we have frozen in our memory the view of the sword and forgotten the plows. And through the preservation this evening, I hope you've gained an appreciation for a different view of one of the many battlefield farms of Gettysburg, the McLean Farm. Those who originally settled it, built it, worked it, endured it, kept it, and eventually how they preserved it. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jason. That was an amazing story, and you certainly brought the incidents and the people to life. We appreciate your time and your sharing your expertise with us. We hope you all enjoyed the program, and if you did, consider making a donation to the Adams County Historical Society. We appreciate your time, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you.